I think to a large degree the Australian public doesn't have a great deal of understanding about the, the marsupial fauna that occurs in, in Australia. Most Australians are pretty oblivious to 90% of Australian fauna. They basically think they're like the bunyip or the yowie that they just make believe. It's startling to, uh, to, to realise that a large degree of the current Australian population have absolutely no recognition or even idea of the mm, diversity of uh, marsupials. I think one of the main reasons why Australians in general seem to know so little about the, the Australian mammal fauna is that the first European settlers when they arrived brought with them the attitudes and the feelings and the love for the old country. They really didn't see much of value in the new Australian environment. And I think that feeling has been maintained even though we've been here now for more than 200 years. Still see a lot of evidence that people are scared of the bush, scared of the things the bush contains. Many of them are active only by night and unless you do spend a bit of dedicated time outdoors looking around in the bush then you're unlikely to see very many marsupials. The great diversity of species we have remains out of sight, out of mind and to a large degree um, people are I still think fearful about, the, uh, about these animals. Because we get to introduce so many people to animals they've never seen before there is a real interest in the species that they see here. So whether it be international visitors or locals, the fact that we have such a variety in our collection really amazes people and I think hopefully they come away really falling in love with a, an animal they really didn't even know existed before they came. Their initial reaction when they see um, a species that they're unfamiliar with is to try and find out what it is. Um, We've got, uh, particularly with, with um, species such as dunnarts, and most people that come through uh, Sydney Wildlife World, they don't know what a dunnart is, and they think it's a rat or a mouse. And um, with a bit of education, they realise um, that it's actually a pretty special animal that's evolved quite differently to most other species. A big thing um, that our study has found is that um, they move a long way. Uh, the animals will move to um, areas that are uh, resource rich. So, um, because of the um, uh, resource availability in, in, in different patches. And the animals actually adapt really, really well, especially our marsupials. They adapt in very, very well in terms of uh, exploiting like, food availability and in terms of what, how they actually carve out their burrows in terms of their niches or their habitats. And uh, they do really, really well. The spotted tail koala, an animal that used to be very common in eastern Australia, but is now really quite uh, quite endangered there. It's a full-on carnivore. It comprises its diet comprises mostly meat. It, uh, it preys on small wallabies, possums. It's even been seen climbing trees and plucking greater gliders almost as big as itself. Other iconic species that we tend to know little about include the, the paddy melons. These are small members of the kangaroo family. They're not seen very much, even though they're quite common in some areas, mostly because they live in dense forest habitats. Usually on dusk or first thing in the morning, you'll see them bouncing about on the sides of the road, quite, uh, quite happily foraging. At the small end of the scale, there are little insectivores called dunnarts. There are about 20 species in the family. They range in size from being absolutely diminutive, about um, half the size of your little finger, up to about 60 or 70 grams, which is the size of a really big mouse. Another group that is, that is really an impressive group, iconic in, in many respects, are the betongs. Part of the rat kangaroo group, there aren't many of the betongs that are left, and what does remain tend to be in small areas. The smaller marsupials are predominantly nocturnal because of their feeding patterns. They're also very small animals, which means that larger animals have a tendency to want to eat them. So being small and nocturnal it is a strategy to stay alive. At birth, the young are really very tiny. They're about the size of a grain of rice, or in the, the bigger species, the kangaroos, not much bigger than a baked bean. 
and this means that the energetic investment in producing young of this size is really very small. They can produce young at different times, while the young of previous births are still dependent on the mother. And this means that if a, a mother has two young, of different ages, both requiring milk, she'll be able to produce milk of two different kinds. Milk that's more suitable for the, uh, the newborn young, and then milk that's more suitable for the, the older young. And they can do this as the young grow, and it's, it's really quite a unique adaptation, and uh, really quite a spectacular one that the marsupials show that the other mammals don't. When Europeans first arrived here just over 200 years ago, they did bring with them their attitudes that the Australian environment was a new and fearful place. To try to make sure that the native species didn't gain the upper hand at any point, the Marsupial Destruction Act was enacted and it required landowners, land managers, to kill marsupials whenever they came across them. In fact, if you compare the record of extinctions over the last 200 years, Australia has lost more than the rest of the world put together. The majority of the animals we house in the nocturnal house are actually threatened species. Australia has lost 11 species of marsupials in the last 200 years. If we don't do anything to stem climate change and deforestation, um, we're going to continue with our um, track record of having the worst species extinction rate in the world. I think that's where the main danger lies with these animals. It's just a simple competition with people and what people bring into a landscape when they come. I think the biggest thing is that we're going to lose a lot of animals that we don't even know. Exist. We need to see education as being the key to the future. We need to, need to make sure that the, the Australian public at large understands that they, they do live in, a, in a, an absolutely unique part of the world with, with so many things that occur here and nowhere else. Once, that, uh, once that's understood and appreciated, then it might be possible to move forward and we might be able to then get the will as a, collectively as a nation to move forward and to conserve some of the species and systems that we're currently losing. If we don't do this, we can expect to see many more extinctions of unique species, species that, uh, that bring with them incredibly important ecological, environmental and economic benefits to Australia. If we can't see far enough to see what our current actions are doing, then what is the future for Australia? I just hope that collectively we can wake up, do something and uh, take stock of what really is currently a pretty awful situation. I am absolutely sure that that education will enhance awareness and awareness in turn will actually precipitate a community involvement and community ownership of, uh, of these animals. And when that actually happens, it is a natural process that people will then actually embrace and then value the species that we have.